We are back. Uh, I, I hope you're able to join us again. We appreciate your faithfulness uh, to the work of studying and learning and meditating on God's word. We'll give it just a minute to get the word out to you. Uh, glad to have you with us again. Going back to First Corinthians. Sorry about that. Going back to First Corinthians. We'll be looking starting at verse 14 through 16. Obviously, we're on part four. So if you miss any of the uh, two preamble lessons or the first three parts, please avail yourselves. Hit that video tab if you're on a computer or a laptop or if you're on a tablet or anything like a smart device like that. Just scroll down and you'll be able to read the description much like you see tonight. A few more seconds here we'll get kicked off Excuse me, with our, our evening's lesson. Again, glad to have you joining us. I don't really like to announce this information, but it is necessary. So if you feel that by the Spirit of God, strictly by the Spirit of God, uh, uh, to be a contributor to the ministry, please avail yourselves of the information just posted. We'd love for you to join us on YouTube. We've got uh, 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 now nearly 80 videos up. So uh, uh, we would love to have you join us. That being said, Let's go ahead and get right back into where we left off. Uh, 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 the point we left off with was dealing with the fact that in, in verses, I do believe that's 12 and 13, Paul uh, carries forth the idea, look, I didn't baptize anybody, uh, but a few, a handful, and I don't even completely remember if any, and I was not cruelly treated and crucified or crucified for you. Uh, so this notion of some say Paul, some say Apollo, some say uh, uh, Peter or Cephas, and uh, some say I'm with or of Christ, just doesn't, it doesn't hold up. It doesn't make sense. So we pick back up in verses 14 through 16 is where Paul, with likely a touch of sarcasm, uh, uh, just the way I, I see it there, that you don't have to hold me to it. It's not an essential in that sense. Uh, 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 touch of sarcasm recounts his few baptismal services he rendered uh, uh concluding verse 16 that he can't rightly recall all he may or may not have physically baptized making the point abundantly clear it isn't so important to be remembered and keeping in mind how much he's dealing with as well so so not diminishing the necessity of ba physical baptism as a outward sign of an inward change and most of you know that phrase but Paul is saying look it is it is not as crucial uh, uh, in terms of some say Paul some say no what I came here to do was ultimately was to to preach Jesus Christ. So ponder the likelihood, and I want to set this forth, and you have to kind of be with me from last week for this to make sense. So ponder the likelihood, as an example, that a man in ministry, let's say uh, a pastor uh, in one community, so he hasn't moved around, he's pastored in one place, let's say about 30 years. Let's say that in 30 years, let's say he started at the age of 30, he's 60 now. Just, 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 just go with me. So this man who is, who is now 60 years of age, he's celebrating 30 years in ministry, not to suggest he's done, but he's celebrating 30 years in ministry. What is the likelihood that he's going to remember, uh, 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 that he's going to remember who he preached to and by preaching to them, they came to a place of faith? What is the likelihood that he's going to remember how many people he gave uh, uh, communion to, not just there at the place of worship, the church as we call it, or as many call it, but even those he may have, when he visited the hospitals, those who were sh sick and shut in, as we used to call it growing up. He, what is the likelihood in 30 years he's going to remember how many, and, and, and communion is an ordinance, holy communion is an ordinance. And of course, even how many he baptized who had come to faith in Jesus Christ, that he baptized by his own hands and by his own strength. What's the likelihood in 30 years that this man is going to remember things extremely significant to those who received that communion and those who were baptized by the hand of this pastor in this singular community who would walk up to him 20 something years into it? Pastor, I know you don't remember me, but you baptized me. I was, I was 17 years old and I came to faith in Jesus. Uh, uh, and now I'm, you know, 37. So 20 years ago and you baptized me and now my children are, are, are coming of age and I got a daughter who's 17 and she just became a believer. Would you baptize? And he's like, oh, OK, sure. He don't remember he baptized her. 
Most pastors are going to be, especially if they're busy about the work of the ministry, you know, day in and day out, Sunday in, Sunday out in terms of preaching, ministering to people, burying people, marrying people, counseling people, studying and teaching the God's word, faithful in prayer, uh, uh, and giving to, you know, much preparation to be able to edify God's people. He's not particularly going to remember, especially if he has a sizable congregation uh, that may change, of course, which they do as they get older and have more children and, and they move away, whatever the case may be. They change over time. Now, there's some pastors who might remember. But what is the likelihood that the average pastor, 30 plus years in the ministry, is going to remember absolutely everybody who walked through every message? Walk, I've had this happen now in almost 30 years of ministry. You preach this message, uh, uh, so and so and so. Oh, okay, that sounds like me. <laughs> so, so Paul is saying, look, I, I'm not saying that baptism is not important, but I, I really didn't baptize many of you because that wasn't necessarily what I was given to do. Uh, 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 so, so, you know. It, it, sorry, so 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 don't make that uh, 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 don't put a big to do on that, and, and and by that, and when I say a big to do, what do they do? They use it as a means, uh, uh, as a part of their their division, as justifying their division. No, his glory comes not from this pastor or anybody like this man. In my example, his glory comes not from uh, those who speak well of his pastoral acts on their behalf. His glory. Uh, is, is with God and before men can be found in, as the author's words, being Paul, I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is close, coming to the end now, right? I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. In other words, I did the job I was tasked to do, and whether I have many testimonies or not from men, I'm not, I didn't do it seeking their approval. Even what he says to Timothy, where he talks about uh, being diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed. A workman working for who? The people? No. They may pay you a salary, but you're not working for the people. They are paying you a salary on the basis, I hope, of obedience to God. That's their part respected to the ministry uh, as they feel led by the Spirit of God, as you heard me say earlier, and respects even to myself. Uh, and I say that very carefully because I know I have pastors and what uh, and so on in the on the channel. And I, I want to say to them, as well as people who, are, who attend places of worship, just because you may give your tithes and offerings, I'll leave it in that in that space. It doesn't mean you you own that man of God or woman of God, whatever the case may be. And, and therefore, hey, we pay your salary. So you know, preach what we want you to preach, baptize who we want you to baptize. No, that man or woman of God, if they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, as was Paul and Peter and James and John and and on and on, for God. It, it's for God, for Christ will uh, live and for Christ i uh, die. So it was not for baptism he was sent, as he goes on in verse 17. Uh, uh, he continues in verse 17, but to preach the good news. Uh, he adds, and not to preach the good, not to preach the good news of Jesus Christ with clever or eloquent words. Stay with me, stay with me, uh, because I know this comes up. Uh, it has been a part of controversy in some cases. So, so let's let's flush this out. That's what we're doing. Let's walk through this so we might uh, properly understand it. Those who give no aspiration to higher learning and university education often misuse this text and such like it to suggest, which most of the time it's Paul, you talking in this matter, several places in Corinthians, in first and second Corinthians about eloquence or uh, 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 of speech or cleverness of speech. Most who do not give themselves to and aspire to any kind of higher biblical learning, take this text and misuse it and basically suggest that, yes, yeah, it don't take all of that. Now you just heard in the previous broadcast where myself and my cohort in the ministry, uh, uh, Brother Bubba or Francis Deal, uh, went on to say, look, you may not have opportunity, most won't have the opportunity to go to seminary and Bible school, but be faithful students of God's word. He added about the need to pray and to trust the Holy Spirit. But understand, the Holy Spirit being an intellectual uh, supreme deity is not going to keep you in and encourage you into a space of ignorance. Paul says in respects to the enemy, I would you not be ignorant or or a novice or unlearned. 
uh, uh, yes, we start as babe designed to send to make of the word that we may grow thereby. True. That's how we start. But we don't stay there. At some point, we want to leaving the principles and doctrine of our most holy faith. Let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to maturity. Paul says himself, it ain't even in my notes, I'm working on this. Paul says, uh, 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 not that I've already apprehended Philippians chapter three. So we're not trying to stay in a position or a place of ignorance, my brothers and sisters. So we, we, we don't want to use texts like this where, where we see there in first Corinthians chapter 17, uh, uh, chapter one, verse 17. But Paul says, I didn't come with the extra eloquence or cleverness uh, uh, of speech. Uh, 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 he's not saying I'm anti or knocking against learnedness <clears throat> and, and, and championing a tolerable measure of anti-education or ignorance. He's simply not doing that. And we must not do that just because we haven't gone to Bible school. And it seems difficult, the things that has been discussed. Even Peter said of Paul's writings, he called them scripture. But he said some of these things are difficult. They are an enigma. They are hard for learning, but he said they are indeed necessary. If you've ever read Romans, you understand <laughs> what he's talking about. Uh, so, so Paul is not 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 encouraging anti-education. He is not championing a a, a tolerable measure of, of dissonance from learning the Word of God to the highest levels possible that we can aspire to in trying to apprehend or grasp God's Word. All of this forgetting that Paul was quite educated, having sat at the feet of what was the greatest teacher, noted as one of the greatest teachers of his day, Gamaliel. You, of course, can look that up and study that. I believe that's talk, talked about in Acts, but you can do some, some research on that and you will see and, and do a little background on Gamaliel. will help you understand uh, how prominent a, a, a rabbi he was in that time, in the first century. That is not what the context says here, or any time su when such phrases is being used. That's not what's being said. It is not suggesting do not aspire to know and learn God's word. That makes no sense whatsoever. That is not to give us any excuse or call. I got to take my time and make sure I'm clear. Do not give yourself pardon and excuse to not be a stu student of God's word. Do not do that. Believe it or not, and I can say this as being one who is of the African American descent, uh, 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 of the uh, descendancy, uh, one who is black. And the reality of it is, some of the first things that the people of color learned was actually the Bible. Learn how to read was the scriptures. You think they would would, would cheer and champion? Uh, uh, any of those who have come through them suggesting that it's okay not to aspire to read and to learn and to know. Uh, how about uh, D.L. Moody, who ends up with D.L. Moody Institute, but if you look at, do a little research on his background, he was not a man who was learning and ends up with D.L. Moody, uh, uh, Dwight uh, L. Moody Institute, Bible Institute. <laughs> so, so, so we may come to God in a place where we do not understand his word, what we know is the gospel, and that he died for our sins, which is the place to start, by the way, but we don't stay there. So what is Paul saying? Again, this phrase is not in, in any way being is to be used in that way. Go back to the preamble lessons. You remember, we had two preamble lessons before we got into 1 Corinthians. Uh, 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 we got into this particular letter I was written to Corinth. Uh, and we know in the Greek city, uh, was filled with transient merchants, also Israelites uh, or Jews, as they were called then, and Roman citizens who were well, who who very well would have been uh, moved by cleverness and philosophical speeches given in public squares, as well as in amber by the eloquence on display during philosophical and even political debates. Real simple. That sounded really wordy, right? Let me make it real simple. In other words, at the time in the first century. Uh, people like Paul and Apollos, we'll, we'll get to in a minute, uh, who had who had come to faith in Jesus Christ and began to preach. The message of the gospel in its purity is very straightforward and very clear. So Paul said, look, there was no need for me to come and do as the philosophers of that day, to, to as the Greek philosophers. There's no need for me to come and to, uh, excuse the term, pontificate, to, to, to get up here and get into to all of this flowery language and go on and on. There's no need for me to, to, to intentionally try to use 
terminology to, to suggest that I myself is educated. He said, look, I'm not here to do that. Remin stay with me, reminiscent of those who would have been doing that in other religions, uh, 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 other uh, uh, cults in particular, uh, those who were speaking for Dinah or speaking for Zeus or, or Apollo, or whatever the case, uh, 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 speaking for uh, Zeus or, or, or speaking for the gods of the Romans and goddesses who would have likely wanted to draw people into their faith systems, who draw people into their cults by, by using eloquent words and speeches. He said, look, we did the opposite of them. I'm not anti-education, Paul says. I'm here saying I know how they are presenting the word that the words that they are presenting about their gods and goddesses. I didn't come doing what they were doing. I come being very plain and very clear. As a matter of fact, Apollos had a natural ability and uh, 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 and spoke with eloquence the things of God. And recall, he became one of the men used to drive the group uh, of believers in division he became because he spoke with such eloquence but that was a natural ability so again let me just say uh, i'll be careful then yeah brother pastor matthew said no don't go back and say to noel jones and say to uh, dr so-and-so so stop doing that and i say this respectfully i actually know of a gentleman somewhere in the area where i live who pastors a church where i live who told me out of his own mouth so i'm not making this up no names clearly who literally told me, he told a, a, a one of the fellow um, leaders, I'll just leave it like that, uh, uh, told them, don't, don't, don't use big words. It don't take all of that. Look, that is not of God. That, that is not wise advice. That is not of God. I've had such things said to me. That's not what the scriptures are saying. And to use such a scripture, not that he did that, but to use such, such a scripture like this is to say, it don't take all of that is unnecessary it is a sign of ignorance it is a sign of cheering on uh, uh, uh to me biblical ignorance in a real way because there are some things in the scriptures that requires much consideration the terminologies used to explain those things may be wordy uh, it may seem difficult but trust me once you look up your definitions and understand those words they are not then so lofty it is just a matter of just how about any kind of word, any kind of thing. You had to learn it, and you wasn't just speaking. You had to speak those words in right context. When we were children, we would just say words as they came to us, and then hopefully we had grown people who understood the necessity to speak relative to a circumstance, a situation we call that when we're reading context, and then help that child develop their use of the language. Yeah, they were hearing people speaking words and were able to speak them, but then it was necessary to have those words come into a, an environment and to be used properly. I mean, you go ahead and use that word so that it was beneficial. So Paul is not saying, look, we tried to dumb it down or we tried to do our best not to sound educated. <laughs> I, I'm driving this home for obvious reason, I've already said, because there are those in the Christian faith to this day who use texts like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 to suggest, see, Paul even said, don't use big words. You haven't read Romans. Talking about a lawyer, Paul could have easily been a lawyer because good Lord Almighty, I mean, it, it, you know, what a tangly way we we <laughs> Anyway, so, 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 but, but, but if you follow through, you, you understand he's answering. He's almost debating with himself, answering, uh, uh, the objections to his writing, which is why Romans uh, can get somewhat wordy in a sense, because Paul is actually writing. He's writing and saying, look, this is what you have to believe. This is why we all have to come to faith. Not Jew, not Greek, not Gentile, not man, not woman, not born, not free. We all need Jesus because all have sinned. But he also then addresses the, 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 the retorts to his words. He's addressing those whom he knows, considering he's a Roman citizen, may argue these points. So shall we continue in sin? One example, God forbid, right? So he answers himself. Where sin abound, grace does much more abound. But shall we continue in sin? God forbid. He realizes by saying that, even though it is a truth, listen to me, it's true. He also says, but for those who are of God, in essence, we don't continue in sin. 
he goes on to explain. We, we who are born of God, we, 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 we don't follow that road. We don't, we don't practice sin. I want to make sure I throw that in and I can go to uh, uh, the second John. But we don't practice sin. We don't continue in sin. Not that we don't commit it, unfortunately. Not that we don't have moments of it. No, we don't practice it continuously. How do you know? Because Romans chapter 7, 14 through 25, when I go to do good, evil is present. My nature is there. I, I, I'm thinking right things, and then something will jump up in my mind and be a temptation. So I got to have my mind renewed, and that's not a one-time renewal. That's a perpetual renewal. Why do I have to have the Holy Spirit according to the gospel, the, the gospel according to John, who is in me, show, reminding me of things because I can forget them, showing me things to come because I can get bogged down in where my life is in any moment. Paul actually ends up suffering from a period of time in, in depression because things weren't quite how, how he had preached and preached and preached and he had gone through a period of time, which we'll get to eventually in 2 Corinthians, where, where he even alludes to the fact that, that you know, things have been, re, re, you know, Ridiculous. They have been extremely difficult. So, so Paul went through a, a time uh, and then he, he you know, got, came back to himself and got back on the high horse, a, a high horse. He got back on the horse and went out to do what he was called to do. So I want to make sure I, I make this abundantly clear. So they even used Apollos, who so happened to be a gifted orator. Is that big word? Speaker. Okay, we'll just say speaker because I know what the word orator means. And I can help broaden your vocabulary by using the word orator. And then you understand an orator is a speaker. Why knock against learning? Now you know. You can say orator. You can say speaker, uh, particularly a public speaker. And you would be right. See? So, so we, And that's why I challenge you in the preambles. That's why I keep alluding to it. We're going to stretch now. We're going to stretch a little bit. Even when we went back to the previous series dealing with a uh, divine relationship, Number one, and we did the first lesson, the pre-lesson, almost in a sense about systematic theology. That's those are not hard terms, but 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 it's not terms that we always think about. And we want to we want to broaden. We want to we want to grow. We want to be stretched. Uh, we want to be pulled, uh, and we want the Holy Spirit to to expand us. Look, if you want God to use you in a greater way, you have to you have to push in in a greater way. You want God to pull more out of you. You have to let God pour more into you. You have to have God pouring more into you to get more out of you. You can't get out of you what's not in you. Okay? So, so, so please understand the necessity of what we're speaking. Charismatic men and women, servants of God in this day, must be careful that their abilities are not used in such a manner as to bring division in the body of Christ whether they may be serving uh, 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 in the body of Christ, wherever, excuse me, they may be serving in the vineyard. I, I know that seems strange, right? Nobody would misuse yes. It happens all the time. We've already talked about it, uh, uh, where, 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 where we become fans, right? We become fanatics. My preacher is so-and-so and so. Man, my pastor is so-and-so and so. Oh, my pastor. I mean, some people say my preacher. You, you, we'll call, you, you know, you're my preacher, right, pastor? Okay, if I'm if I'm that pastor, I, I'd be really concerned that that man or woman is saying something to that effect. My pastor is the best pastor. I believe that's a teaching moment, and this is just again for my brothers and sisters in ministry, uh, uh, especially those as pastors. And I say that because you are constantly before the people. If you hear that kind of stuff being discussed, while you appreciate the the sentiment. You may want to take it as a teach. I'm just encouraging the teaching moment to say, wait a minute. No, Christ, did I die for you? Well, Pastor, you know what I mean? Did I die for you? But you've been there for me. No. Are you trying to tell me that every time you needed someone to be there, I was there every time? Every time? Well, you know, Pastor, I understand exactly. So, 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 so don't aggrandize me. Essentially, don't worship me. Pastor, I ain't worshiping you. What else do you call it? When you're speaking in such lofty terms, we have to be careful. And this is what Paul is doing. Paul is bringing them. He's saying, look, it's become a, a matter of division. And again, as we've already covered, I won't go over it too much. But as we covered in previous, in, in the last week, as a matter of fact, you know, let me, let me check it out, make sure. Uh, we, we do not want to do that to our leaders. We do not want to put our leaders in a position where, where they, are being, they are being practically worshipped. 
we get offended if somebody like me says it, but let's be real. Let's be real. There's one thing to appreciate. It's another thing to go beyond simply saying, thank you, pastor. That was a wonderful word. And I'll chew on it and let God work on me to my pastor is the best. Ain't he the best dress? Look at first lady. Now, not everybody calls him first lady, but look at the pastor's wife. Isn't she the prettiest pastor's wife? Oh, she's the prettiest. You're going too far. You're going too far. Have you seen every uh, pastor's wife in the world? No. Have you sat under every pastor that exists in the in the world, let alone in even in the city you're in? No. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but my pastor is super spectacular, super fast, fabulous, expiatidosis. Stop that madness. Yes, I'm taking my time right here because Paul says this is a division. This was a division, brothers and sisters. Paul didn't just blow past this. This was an issue in the church, and I'm telling you, as I told you last week, it happens to this day. I grew up in a religion. I grew up in an affiliation with a religion. Now they call them denomination. It used to be called a religion, where they would have appreciation services, right? So they would call people to come for two and three days. Sometimes it used to be a week, but now they're down to two or three days. Now it's down to one service, actually. But it got down to two or three days for, for a good long time. And people would come and preachers would come and they would get up and how you both to praise your pastor, pray for your pastor, and this for your pastor, that for your pastor. It's right to buy your pastor a Cadillac. It's right to send your pastor to the Bahamas. It's right to do this and that. And if you ask you right, preacher, that's why they invited the man to justify practically worshiping the pastor. That's why they did it. Trust me. I'm a pastor's kid. And my father would get in the car. Why do they do all that? And we look at him like, you don't know? <laughs> They're doing it for you. He said, yeah, but that's not necessary. And he would get up when they would finally release him to speak. He would basically say it, you know. Uh, 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 and, of course, they, it didn't matter because it was formalism. It's just what they would do. It was what they would do. Uh, anyway, how uh, would John Calvin or Martin Luther uh, feel about having their names attached to religious movements supposing to better equip and edify the body of Christ but have at times served as instruments of division. I wonder how they would feel. I don't think it, they won't, they would, John Calvin would want to hear the word Calvinism. I don't think so. I don't think John Calvin would really want something to be called Calvinism. I really don't. Uh, 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 how about, uh, uh, how might Paul and his fellow apostles feel to know that their epistles have at times been used like hammers upon the heads and burdens upon the necks and backs of many believers of their day? How would they feel to know that their words, which are meant to bring unification around the gospel, are actually have actually been used within the body of Christ to bring division? How would they feel to, to know that their words, which are supposed to admonish and correct and rebuke so that we would be unified, have in fact become means of, through interpretation, to, to, to be a, a place of division? Again, it's not, I go to this church here, you go to that church there. That's not that's not anywhere in scripture. The issue is the reason why I don't go to that church and I go to this one is because they ain't preaching the right word. Now we have an issue. Now we I used to go to that church on the corner, but now I'm down here telling them, yeah, don't go over there because that pastor is this, 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 that, and the other. And if there's any truth to that, that's even worse. That's bad, should I say. And if there's no truth, that's even worse. Because now you are being divisive. And Paul is talking not only to the people in Corinth, but he is talking to you. Yeah, I'm nailing this thing. Paul offered no example for any uh, uh, one at any point to try to judge another as to what he meant by one type of speech in opposition to another, but makes his point clear. My goal was not to do anything for which such a division among you would be merited, including I didn't baptize you. So Paul says, look, man, you, I did all this preaching about Jesus Christ. And in the final analysis, you took what I did and what Apollos did and what Cephas or Peter did, and you turned it into division. No, he says, I was plain. I was clear. I came with no other agenda but to convey the cross bore by Jesus Christ as I could. I was this, and I wanted to be so clear so that my message would be fully effective. And indeed was because people came to faith in Jesus Christ. 
For carnality's sake, they subverted the preaching of all, be it Paul, Apollos, or Peter, to their own purpose. We already talked about it, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Let me slow it down. Do you understand it before we move on? Do you understand the magnitude? He, he spends some time and delves into this from, chap, from, from chap, verse 10 to verse 17. And he's, he's just going to build on that. But, but before we build, go to the next step, do you understand the magnitude? I'm telling you that to this day, this happens not just one church to another. I'm telling you within the confines of a church. Within the confines of a church, this happens. If you have multiple elders or preachers or deacons, or uh, 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 you have let's, uh, two different singing groups, two different choirs, it depends on the size of the church you go to. Sometimes they actually have two different choirs or two different versions of a choir. I actually went to a church, again, not saying any names, because I have people who represent those places, uh, uh, churches I've gone to uh, throughout my years. There's a church, however, from where I grew up. I'll just leave it like that. Those who know me know where I grew up. Literally, they have a contemporary service and a traditional service. And those of you who, who are in those kind of situations, you know exactly what I mean. They literally have a service so they can sing traditional hymns. Turn to page 365. Turn to page. Uh, uh, and, and then they have a second service, not because they need to have a second service, but they literally will do a second service and call it the contemporary service so they can sing, con quote, contemporary Christian music. Even now, now uh, uh, let me not, I'm not going to do that, but, but even in, in, among other nationalities, I won't say which, you find, well, no, I want amazing grace. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? I want amazing grace. Y'all never sing what I want to hear. And this will be a person who sits in the pews. I, I, I sing. I play music. I, I've been in choirs. I've been in groups. I've sung solos. I, you know, on and on and on. Do you understand these things become divisive? I literally had somebody, and I played drums in both services. I actually had somebody come up to me. See, the reason why I come to this service, same message, by the way. Same message preached in the first and second service. Literally had somebody come up to me and say, I, I didn't know her, come up to me and say, oh, I really like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I come to the first service, but I, I stay for the praise and worship of the second service. I'm just telling you. She literally said to me, yeah, because I also like that too. And then I go home after the praise and worship. <laughs> so I sit through a service and a half so that I can get that music, the message, and then I stay for the next service so I can get that music too. Divisive. It, it's, it's divisive. And I don't even know if that church, I haven't been there in many years, if they're still doing that. That was, wow, 2001. So that was 18 years ago. I left in 2002. So that's 18, 17, 18 years ago. They literally had two services, and they're not the only one that was in town doing that. They literally had two services. You can go on some websites right now, particularly of churches of size, and you will see they have a contemporary and a traditional service. While that in and of itself does not mean divisive, the reality of it is you have to ask yourself, why? Who are they trying to appease? God? Is that to worship God? Or is that to, is that to appease the people in the pews? And let's just be honest, the leadership. See, see, I ask myself these questions as a person who is in ministry because I don't want to fall prey to so busy trying to please the, 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 the ears of people. So now I better sing Amazing Grace or I better go to the hymn. Yeah, you know, I don't sing hymns here. Oh, I don't want to lose a tithe pair. Oop. I said that out loud, so I might as well work with it. I'm afraid to lose a tithe pair, so we better eventually now we got two services. Yeah, you know, I, I love that tradition of them young people, the whippersnappers. Do you actually think that two or three generations after many of the psalms had been written, where, you know, I, I like David's songs. I don't really like Solomon's songs. And them sons of Korah, I mean, those was all right, too, but I really prefer David's songs over the... You understand? You understand the magnitude of what we're talking about here? Let, let's go ahead and get into, let's go to that next level. So in verses 18 through 25, we won't cover all this now. We're just working through it. In verses 18 through 25, Paul ascends like climbing a ladder. His exposure and rebuke of their divisive misuse of God's chosen vessels 
and draws a stark contrast, watch this, between the wisdom of man and that of God as reflective or as indicative of those who are perishing versus those who are being saved. Real simple. So Paul has said, let me address this divisive, this, this, this divisive, I believe, uh, uh, construct put in the, into the church uh, that has risen up in the church in Corinth by Satan. So let me address that first. First of all, let me greet you. Hey, how you doing? And then let me come in and say, stop doing that. That's divisive. Why are you dividing over who preached to you? As I think I said, who, who, who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light? Because we all preach Jesus Christ. Now that I've established that, that this is God's will, that Jesus Christ be preached, I did that for a year and a half. Paulos, uh, Acts chapter 18, he came right behind me. He did not come preaching as one uh, uh, commentary I read, which obviously I disagreed with. He did not come bringing division. No, he came preaching the same Christ. But you made it an issue of division. So stop doing that because I didn't come trying to be eloquent like the other religions of that day, other, the, the occults of that day, the other religions. No, I came with the, with the concise, precise message of Jesus. Now, concise and precise doesn't mean it was not full. But I came preaching Jesus Christ, and I suspect if he was there a year and a half, he preached it from every angle, position, from old, you know, from Genesis through uh, Malachi that he could present it including, I suspect, his testimony of what happened on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, right? So, so, so now that I've covered that, now let's go up this ladder, let's go up another step or two. And now let me address the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God, see? So, so, so look, this is a letter, it's continuous. So, so now we've dealt with that, I got something else to discuss. Now we have to draw a contrast because the fact that you were able to get in this back and forth with each other and began to, to battle with each other is because you don't understand that man has a wisdom and God has a wisdom which is reflective or indicative of those who are perishing, watch this, and those being saved. The wisdom of men, those who are perishing. The, uh, 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 the wisdom of God, those who are being saved, as, we, as he will make clear. First thing to keep in mind, however, is that he is not uh, 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 deviating or, or diverting away from the central position of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He had already preached to them. He's not moving away from that. This is That's why I said he's just stepping up the ladder. He's not now, uh, uh, okay, I dealt with that, drop that, let me go over here and talk about this. No, he's saying, now on the basis of Jesus Christ, him crucified, that this is what God the Father has intended through Jesus Christ our Lord, verses 1 through 9. Let me handle this division because Christ is not divided. I did not die for your sins and I did not baptize most of you. I'm, I'm, I'm building on this notion, uh, uh, not this notion, on this construct. The, the, matter of fact, what does the Bible call Jesus? The chief cornerstone. So we're building. We're building. We're building. We, we've dealt with the fact that it was G, it was God in the first place who did it. Let's deal with the fact that you are dividing, trying to say Christ is divided. No, he is the central point and the message about him. The gospel is the central message. Come back together. Stop being divided. That being said, let's go to the next step. And the next step is we got to make sure you understand the difference between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. Because apparently this is where you have made your heir. And you don't understand how serious it is because there are those who are perishing behind the wisdom of man and there are those who are being saved behind the wisdom of God. And I'll give you a hint. The wisdom of God is the gospel. The wisdom of God is the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't have a problem with multiple churches. And, and where I live, literally, there are churches, and I've actually seen this several times, I, there are churches almost sharing the same. Matter of fact, there is at least... Two churches I know of that are next to each other and sharing the same parking lot. Don't ask me how it works. They're sharing the same parking lot. Two very separate churches, two different names, I believe two different denominations, sharing the same parking lot. I don't have anything to say about that other than it was funny. It was just, it was just interesting. I had intended on visiting. I used to live literally up the street from them. I never did get there because I was busy. <laughs> I was married with three kids at the time, so I didn't have time. But 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 I want you to understand the magnitude of that. 
I saw another one, uh, uh, not too far from that one. Uh, they don't share the same parking lot, but two fairly large uh, 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 um, in terms of building structure who are almost, there's a, there's a, a divide there. Excuse me, there is a divide there, but they're practically, you can turn in one driveway and turn in the other, and you literally be a, a one church or the other, built that close together. This is not uncommon, apparently in the South. But I'm not here to say that there's any issue there. Are they preaching the same gospel? Could the people in one congregation get up and walk out and walk into the other building, and the people in the other walk into the other building and receive the same gospel message? Is Jesus Christ indeed still crucified yet risen from the dead and sitting at the right hand of the Father? Is the word of God not just the gospel itself, but we might as well say it since we have the full canon, is the word of God being properly explained from Genesis to Revelation? Then indeed, in effect, the audiences can flip-flop and, and they are receiving the full effect of the scripture. Is faith coming by hearing? Hearing by the word of God. No, ladies and gentlemen, he is not diverting away from the central position of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, which he had laid, we know he preached, like, con like a concrete layer laying down the foundation to a building. No, he has laid the foundation. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it a different way, but he has laid the foundation. And now he's saying, look, that, that we've dealt with that division. We've dealt with that division. Now let's understand we must, there is something being built on that. Hence, verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross of Christ is foolishness. So again, we're dealing with the gospel. The message of the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing and salvation to those who are being saved. Let me slow it down. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And it is salvation to those who who are being saved. Let me make these two quick points and then we'll pick it back up and we'll, we'll, we'll seek to understand. Uh, uh, matter of fact, three quick points. Let me squeak. Yeah, I have time to get these in and then we'll come back uh, uh, and deal with this. So what is meant by perishing and foolishness? What is meant by perishing and foolishness? I'm sure you want to know. So let me tell you. Perishing here deals with those given to destruction. For example, Judas Iscariot, who was called the son of perdition. That word essentially translates, so, uh, can also be said, the son of destruction. He is the son of destruction. And we know who his father was. He was of his father, the devil. But he was a disciple of Jesus. He, uh, what did Jesus say in, in the gospel according to John chapter 17? I lost none except the Judas, who was the son of perdition. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is second Bible study, and, and, and essentially uh, two and a half hours, a little over two and a half hours, so it's working on me. Uh, uh, he is the son of perdition. I didn't lose it. None was plucked out of my hand except one who was not of me in the first place. He was of destruction. Perish here deals with those given to destruction like Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition or destruction. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul calls them, these who are given to destruction, he calls them disobedient. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he describes them as unrighteous people who suppress the truth of God by their unrighteousness, knowing full well the truth that God had made clear to them by himself. God made it clear to them what the truth was about him, and in particular, of course, who Jesus Christ would be, prophetically speaking, and they held that truth in unrighteousness, is what he says in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. They suppressed the truth of God in their unrighteousness. Christ called these same ones who were perishing tares, which have been sown among the wheat by Satan. You can find that. You can read it for yourself. Matthew chapter 13, 24 through 30. Matthew chapter 13, 24 through 30. According to Christ, some will even come to him, calling him Lord, Lord, and listing off their spiritual religious accomplishments they perform. We, didn't we cast out devils in your name? On and on and on. 
their, their spiritual religious accomplishments they perform by his authority, but he will respond, depart from me, me, you who worked iniquity, I never knew you, Matthew chapter, you can see this in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49. Let me, let me just slow it down a minute to make sure we don't miss this. These who are perishing, we can go to Matthew 25, uh, uh, 31 through 45, I do believe, talking about sheep and goats. I've taught on this about the contrast in scripture. Those who are of God, those who are not of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, those who are perishing, those who are being saved. Do you see the constant contrast in scripture? They left us for they, they were not of us. I believe that's in the, the, the second, I believe. So understand that there is a constant contrast that is happening. Let the wheat and the tare grow together. And I love one of the, the accounts I read in, in expositing that particular uh, uh, parable, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and said that the wheat and the tare, now watch this, he's not talking about tare sown into the church among the believers. No, that's tare sown into the world. And actually, if you read the exposition or the explanation Jesus gives, that proves that to be true. He's talking about the fact that in the world, there are those who have been sown. We already talked about Judas Iscariot that have been sown by Satan. They are of. Matter of fact, Jesus said in the gospel according to John, I believe the gospel according to John chapter eight. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Those coordinates could be wrong. He says, you're of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. Remember, they were trying to murder him. You're of your father, the devil, because if you were Abraham before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham was looking for my day and saw it. So you are not of Abraham. He is not your father, because if he was your father, you would love me. You would believe me. You are not of Abraham. So, so understand how important I'm taking my time through here. How important is this, Brother Gabe? It is so important that Paul says, look, man, you, you, look, look, man, woman of, of God, you've got to get this, that there are two groups, not five groups, not 10 groups, two, two, tares, wheat, sheep, goat, unsaved, saved, the disobedient and the obedient. On and on and on and on. He makes it abundantly clear. The word of God, I should say, makes it abundantly clear. clear. And so when we understand this, uh, uh, that's why the Bible says we are not of this world. We've already quoted it for uh, 1 John, I believe, chapter 2, 15, 16, 17, in this world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So then those who are perishing, verse 18, are those who are set for destruction. They are of the devil. And I'm not calling anybody other than Judas Iscariot and other than who the Bible refers to. Please do not walk away from this saying, now go and look and you are the devil. Because Ephesians chapter 2, matter of fact, stops you from doing that. Those verses we alluded to because he says, oh, by the way, we were of them. We were just like them. If you need more reference, Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one was seeking after God. No one was, was, was pursuing him. We were dead in trespasses and sins. That's Ephesians. Everybody was. So none of us have a right to point a finger and say, you are of the disobedient. You're going to hell. We cannot. Matter of fact, uh, Corinthians tells us, judge no man before their time. Judge in that particular case, ladies and gentlemen, is not uh, uh, don't assess anyone. It's saying don't determine someone to hell or heaven. You don't have a right to do that, nor do I. Jesus in the, and, I, and, I, and I'm sorry for bouncing around, but it's coming to me, so I'm giving it to you. Jesus, when he tells the parable of the tear and the wheat, he, they said, well, shall we go out and, and pull it up? He said, no, at least you pull up the wheat. Just let it grow and let it grow. So in the world, we have unbelievers and believers. We have the disobedient and we have the obedient and we're all living together. We're just not of them. We are new creations. We are different now. That's why our ways must glorify. Uh, you're going to make me. Do it. I got a few minutes left. Let me finish it. So Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Understand these tares, these goats, these disobedient, these some refer to as reprobates were never of God. But what that simply means is they lived as unbelievers in the gospel. They considered the gospel, I'm ahead of myself a little bit, to be nonsense. 
As a matter of fact, the word foolishness simply means those just described counted the gospel message as mere folly, as moronic, as moron, uh, uh, moros, I believe is the Greek term. That's where we get our word moronic. Moros is where we get our word moronic. They considered the word of God moros or moronic, right? So these people are people, no matter how much you live before them, the, the, the life of, uh, 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 that, that is lived in circumspect and quiet and, and serving God, and you're not giving too much drink, you're not giving too much party, that would be Ecclesiastes, you're not giving to revelry, you're not giving to cussing. I'm sorry, but the scriptures, uh, I'm sorry, not sorry, the scriptures talk about that, uh, a profane mouth, you're not, you're not giving to that. You may be struggling with it, but if you're struggling, that's good. Struggle till you overcome. But if you're just given to cussing and you're justifying your cussing, you're given to strong drink, get drunk. Hey, I got to get drunk. God understands. You're given to a, a life that does not represent having the fruits of a changed life, of having the Holy Spirit on the inside. I'm not talking about a time when you slip, fall, get drunk. I'm not talking about a time when your buttons are pushed so to the point where you use profanity. I'm not talking about committing sin. I'm talking about practicing sin. These people are the ones who are, uh, 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 are perishing. These people. So don't judge yourself for as one who has committed sin, who falls. The just man, the Old Testament tells us, fall seven times over one thing. And Jesus says, my God is coming to me. And Jesus said, how many times should a person be forgiven? You say seven times seven. I believe Peter spoke up. He said, no, 70 times seven. And this is one infraction. The implication is one infraction. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. The reality of it is a believer will make mistakes. Peter, who preached and God moved in Cornelius' house, then acts like he didn't know Cornelius. Look, man, Peter was an apostle at this point. He had already been converted. So the notion that you will never commit a sin is a falsehood. And as a matter of fact, 1 John chapter 2 says, and if you say you have no sin, or either chapter 1 or chapter 2 says, and if you say you have no sin, you're lying. If you say that you are incapable of sin because you have the Holy Spirit, you're lying and the truth is not in you. I'm not here to spill my, 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 my life before you, but I have erred as a believer. I got saved at 17. I've been married more than once. I have erred, ladies and gentlemen. Again, I'm not here to get into my business, but the reality of it is I have erred. I have erred. I have sinned. I have transgressed. I have committed sin. And God has, thankfully, where my sin had abounded and it got bad in some spaces, but his grace much more abounded. And I was, I was repentant. I turned away from those infractions. And I encourage you, uh, let me go and just get this in. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do the same. Truly, brothers and sisters in Christ, no, you're feeling that, ah, oh, I shouldn't have went that way. I shouldn't have did that thing. I shouldn't have said that thing. Turn away from that thing. Don't wallow in it. Don't play in it. Don't, don't justify yourself in it. No, we find our, whom he, whom he calls, he qualifies, whom he qualifies, he judges. That's not ministry, by the way. That's salvation, whom he calls into salvation. He justifies, and as he justifies them and deems them just before himself, he, he qualifies them. He qualifies, justifies, glorifies. He makes them right before him. He makes them holy. He makes them sacred. Remember that word? He makes them holy or saints. Hegias. He makes them right before him. We don't make ourselves right. He makes us right. Knowing this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he that has begun a good work and you shall perform it. Uh, chapter 2, uh, 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 work, uh, you know, Work out your soul's salvation with fear and trembling. Verse, that's verse 12, but verse 13, knowing that God is the one who worked it. I'll be there to preach that. So foolishness simply means those who describe as, as wallowing in, who practice continuously. Look, this is just an example. Who are, who are living with someone and you know you're not married and you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're living together and you're behaving yourself as married. You have not presented yourself to the world properly as a married couple, but you're behaving yourself, quote unquote, as a married couple. That is what we call practicing sin. You are living together. You are in sin and stop excusing yourself. Now, that's just an example. And I'm only admonishing you. This is not me being condemning. I'm telling you, if you truly believe yourself a Christian, you've got to get out of that situation. Otherwise, your fruit, what's coming out of you 
How can a good tree bear bad fruit? The words, actions, and deeds. Your actions suggest you are not a believer and was never a believer, the fact that you didn't even make such a decision. So if you've made such a decision and you go, oops, I'm not supposed to be here, get out of there. Gabe, you just don't understand. Live on the street. It is better. What does he say? To, 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 to die minus an eye, minus a hand, than to go straight to hell with all of your members. I know that's hard. I know that's tough. I have been in difficult situations, but I'd rather live for God and, and, and he be glorified in my life, no matter how hard it is, than to, than to live for myself and live comfortably. And how could you even be living comfortably? How could you climb into bed with that woman or that man, sir? Ma'am, how can you do it? And I, I even got into homosexuality and all those things, but how can we do it? If we're ongoing practicing on a continuous, and that doesn't even justify the committing of it, but we know we should not be practicing it because it is an indication that he does not know us and we indeed do not know him. And so the gospel to that person is foolishness. What do you say when you're in that kind of situation? Hopefully none of us say it. But you know what we say? Ah, God loves me. He understands. We're justifying it. We're fixing it. We're making it work. Hey, turn uh, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Let me rush on to Genesis chapter 6, and you will see humankind rejecting God's message of judgment as preached by Noah for 100 years and 20 years until he and his family, along with the creatures that God determined to be spared, his wrath entered into that ark, and then it rains nonstop for 40 days and 40 nights. They deemed the message and actions of Noah and his family in building the ark as folly. They thought it was foolishness. They thought it was moronic. They thought it was stupid. They said, it ain't rain. Rain, what is that? We ain't never seen rain because there had been no rain upon the earth. They did exactly what we do today. And if I if I just had time, I'd go to the parable that he talks about Lazarus and, and, and the rich man. The rich man and Lazarus, excuse me, and Lazarus laying at the gate of the rich man and die. Both men die. And one man lifts up his eyes, uh, essentially in hell, with a gulf in between. And the other man in the bosom of Abraham, essentially meaning he is in the place in Hades. This is where Jesus has died, right? So he's in the place of Hades that is a pleasant place. It is a paradise place waiting for Jesus to die and resurrect and for him to go on and be with Jesus. And that man via the parable is in the bosom of Abraham, in Abraham. And the rich man looks over and says, Abraham, tell Lazarus to come and dip his finger in this big gulf between us and quench my tongue in this fire, in this torment. And Abraham says, the gulf is too big. He cannot cross over. Well, Abraham, Father Abraham, Go and send him back and tell my brothers, I got brothers that, I think six brothers, and tell them, don't come this way. Don't live like I've lived. And Abraham says they have, they have the law and the prophets. And if they won't hear the law and the prophets, uh, uh, he said, no, they won't do it. So that, send a man from the dead. He said, no, if they don't hear the law and the prophets, they won't listen to Moses. They won't listen to the prophets. Then clearly they're not going to hear a man from the dead. A man from the dead. Get it? Jesus. The gospel. See how that comes back? They're not going to believe the gospel. It is foolishness to them. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It is foolishness. Notice I'm staying on the gospels because that's the gospel. Excuse me. It's only one message. Gospel because that's where Paul stayed. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Is there other things in the scripture? Yes, but if you carefully read the scripture, you realize how all that stuff, even though it seems like it's going like this, somehow, some way, by the by the genius of God, which is a terrible word because he's beyond genius, it all comes right back to Christ. As a matter of fact, I know how it does. Matthew chapter 5, 17 and 18, till the word is fulfilled. He is the fulfillment of that word. So all the stuff about sacrifices and all the stuff, all the accountings of people bring that word right back together in Jesus. And so Jesus and the culmination of Jesus being the gospel message. And so Paul says, look, the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God, we'll get into that more precisely. So I'm going to just tease you with that and leave it. But I pray that this has been a blessing to you, brothers and sisters. Uh, 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 share this out. Hit that URL. Copy it on your page so that people can be blessed. I'll be sharing this in just a moment on my page. Again, if God has blessed you to, to, to be a contributor, 
please, by all means, do that as you're led by the Spirit. The information is there for you. Definitely connect with us on YouTube uh, so that you can follow us there. We just uploaded a couple of more videos. We're trying to get some more done this week. We'll also be uploading our teaching from the Essentials of Faith class sometime tomorrow. So until uh, Thursday, 9 Central Standard Time, we will see you then. Until then, be blessed. <laughs>